Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. And I'm Sylvia Earle, founder of Mission Blue, National Geographic explorer at large. At large. <laughs> at large. And I am an ocean elder. Thank you, ocean elders, for hosting this event. Yes, this is our show, Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations with the ocean community on topics of wonder and interest. We hope everyone has made some time to get outdoors and great big congratulations to all of our recent graduates out there. Um, I'm gonna to start to share the screen and wanna remind everyone that you can put questions and answers in the Q&A box and we'll get through as many as we can today and remind everyone that the world is. Blue, you have to visualize it this time, but you can. See in your mind this beautiful blue living biogeochemical miracle that we call home. Yes. And I have to remind our wonderful host Gigi to allow me to share the screen, please. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, um, I'm really grateful today to have Dr. Rich Moy from California Academy of Sciences coming back to us again for part two of echinoderms in action. Back by popular demand. Yes. I mean, <laughs> not everything was covered the first time, and I dare say we won't be able to cover everything this time, but keep going. You, may, you might have to come back another time. Just oh, heck. Do... Oh, heck. <laughs> 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 it's too much fun. How could I not go back? But maybe we should do a deep dive in the future into those deep, deep echinoderms. I remember when deep sea mining first became kind of a headline issue in the 1980s. And Lockheed had studies just to explore down there and see what was there. And they came back and I read the report and the comment was, well, there's nothing down there but sea cucumbers. <laughs> well, I've I've seen a lot of a lot of square inches and square meters of of the deep sea floor, and uh, it's very difficult to um, take a photo without getting a any kind of derm sneaking in there and photo bombing all that beautiful ooze. I think they they think they own the deep sea. They do. They do. Well. Lockheed thinks they own the deep sea. <laughs> they do. <laughs> and um, now, now that we know what we are beginning to know about these incredible creatures, we should show them some respect, really. I agree. I couldn't agree more. And um, I think it's, it's um, hubris to think that we are the epitome of evolution. If you think about an organism that can make its... Um, make a perfectly comfortable life at temperatures that are just above the freezing level at pressures that are three to 400 atmospheres. I, I think they, they deserve more than respect. They deserve our awe, you know, they're just, Absolutely. Um, just incredible. And, and uh, we are only just starting to scratch the surface about what we think we know. Um, never mind what, what is, what is fact. I have, I'm sitting in a lab here and it's I'm surrounded by specimens of species that have not yet been described. They're, they're new to science. They're sea urchins that are new to science. And I still can't get over the intricacy with which they're constructed and the beauty with which they have evolved adaptations that you and I could never even dream of. How um, do they even escape? when they start out as little guys in the plankton everybody wants to eat them and well there, there's that and and how do they make it all the way to the bottom without getting eaten you when you think about many of these organisms are brooders but by no means all of them so the the mother will retain the the babies and so that's how they stay in the deep sea but but you're right there's a, the the vast majority of them are what they call broadcast spawners that release um, their eggs and sperm into the water and they, they mix in the water and they form their 
their little zygotes and then the larvae and they're up in the plankton. And eventually um, they become what they say competent to settle and they have to drift down a few kilometers without getting eaten <laughs> on the way down in the elevator. And think of the changes, not just pressure, but light changes, mm -hmm. pressure yeah. certainly. And they'll just and so they many. the bottom and they metamorphose into a tiny version of the adult and they continue to grow and do wonderful things in the environment down there. But we really don't know what it is they are doing there. And I think that's that brings us back to this point about what what is it about the deep sea um, that attracts humans? Well, there's nothing down there but sea cucumbers. But the truth of the matter, of course, <laughs> is there's a heck of a lot more than just sea cucumbers. And, uh, you, you know, yeah, I yeah. mean, the, um, the, the ecosystems are, are, are complex enough that we, we are really only just starting to understand what they are. And in fact, what they mean to the health of the oceans and therefore to the health of all of us. So, you know, that's a, that's something that um, I think should all give us all a little pause and a little moment to, to think about um, what we don't know. I, th I think there's a, there's a big push to explore the rest of the universe and to check out what's on Mars. And I, I, I think that's all wonderful. I, I, I love knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Um, and maybe someday it will mean something to human survival, but I really hope that that isn't necessary. I really hope that we will understand enough about the workings of our own planet and come to realize what mistakes we are making now and, and correct them so that going to Mars isn't going to be necessary. Absolutely. We'll, we'll certainly enhance our chances of a long and prosperous future if we protect nature. And the right. deep sea is currently on the chopping block for mining. Yep. The high seas on the chopping block for industrial fishing. We continue to pour noxious things into the ocean as well as taking things out. But maybe what you're saying about respect, understanding, uh, we know enough to know better to take care of the systems that make our existence possible while oh, we yes. still have no, yeah. that's that's exactly right. Um, I I do I've seen like most people. I would delicately say my age. Um, <laughs> we've seen a lot of change, and I am no longer seeing some of the things I used to see when I was a kid. Uh, the bird populations have changed. Um, the seashores have actually changed. And anybody who goes to the Caribbean now will, will realize just how much it's changed uh, just by biomass of seaweed alone, you know. Um, that wasn't the way it was uh, decades ago. And um, just think of what these species that we're, you're talking about, how long they have existed as a category of life and what a short time our history. I mean, we can trace it back to the, the same era as echinoderms, if you really go way back. Yeah, but way back. As primates, we're such newcomers. We really are. We're just, we're, I think it was, I can't, I'm trying to remember who it was that said, maybe it was Mark Twain said that we were the, we were the layer of paint on the top of a, of a flagpole. If, if, the rest of the, if the rest of the column is a column of time. <laughs> um, so yes, that's how, that's how important we are and, and how little time. I mean, they say, I, I am asked a lot about um, global change, climate warming, uh, uh, global warming and, and the effect of, of uh, changes in acidification and so on and so forth. And they said, well, all of that stuff's changed in the past. It was a lot hotter. You telling me it was a lot hotter in the Eocene. And I said, well, that's true, um, but you're forgetting one four letter word that you always have to keep in mind when you're talking about anthropogenic change. And that word is rate, R-A-T-E. Yes. Um, we have done more to change the environment in a hundred years, a, a mere century. You know, if you're talking about 
a layer of paint at the top of the flagpole, that's a few molecules. And organisms normally in times of uh, millions of years of change, you know, you're taking hundreds of thousands of years to change um, during the Eocene uh, when there was a climate maximum, organisms track that change. That's what they do. It's why there is life on Earth. It's, it's why there is a diversity of life on Earth, is that organisms track that change by changing themselves um, through evolutionary processes and the survival of those that are fitted, are adapted to those environmental changes, that can respond to those environmental changes. And we're not giving them a chance. No, but they what, can't possibly. But but what I think we've got going for us is that we have a conscious choice because what we're doing is working not in our favor. We're we're taking the planet down. <laughs> we are, you know, it's four and a half billion years to get here and four and a half decades or so, maybe a couple of centuries, to unravel those very systems that have developed a, a world that works in our favor. We're, this is habitable for us right now. Knowing what the problem is, we have a chance to do something about it. And all that you're going to share with us now about just knowing the nature of nature, we should really protect it as if our lives depend on it, because in fact, they do. They do. They do. And so, we we have a chance to shift from this to recovery. The question is, will we, can we get ourselves, our, our act together? Enough people sense the urgency, you certainly do. We've been, you've been thinking about the nature of life on earth for a long time. And kids, happily, <laughs> um, have an edge on grownups that, that they're, in, in their first 10 years, 21st century 10 years, they know things that I as a kid could not know. Neither could you, nobody could. What earth was like from space? What, what lives in the deep sea? Sea cucumbers. <laughs> <laughs> Why, is this, <laughs> Why does it matter? Why does yeah. it matter? It's, it's, now we have loads of information that that nobody had. It's how do we take that to heart and make the choices that will keep think, us safe and seek cucumbers too. And I think I think you're you're phrasing it the right way when we talk about the future of mankind because we are we are not apart from nature. We are part of it, and um, what happens to nature, so go we. And one of the really important things I think to keep insisting on is that people realize that it's not just the quality of life. It, it, it could in fact be survival. I don't know if you've, have you seen that movie Interstellar? Yes. Interstellar? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, that movie says it better than, yeah, you know, I wish people would, would take the, the central message of that movie to heart, which is not so much that we will save ourselves by moving to another planet, but that, that we wrecked the old one. <laughs> uh, you know, you know um, that. the question is, do we know how to fix it? Yeah. And, and I think we do. I think we have the answers to many of the issues, but there also has to be a socio-political wherewithal, a socio-political um, desire to follow through on, on the science. And right now, science is just struggling to be science. Um, it's it's uh, uh, met with derision in some quarters. And I think um, this this makes our job, it's it's like a hydra that you have to keep chopping the, the, the heads off of. It's, uh, it keeps coming at you from so many different directions that the main message of, of saving the planet and therefore saving ourselves is having a hard time beating its way through uh, the din of, of anti-science rhetoric that is constantly flowing out the way affluent flows into the ocean. 
Yeah. It's incredible. Just even here in the in the San Francisco Bay, just like millions of gallons. And just yeah, know. yeah. Well, we yeah. had we just had a a news report of several beaches that are no longer actually safe for people to go in and and swim at you know, Stinson Beach and some of the famous beaches along the along the coast here. And these are these are places that have rolling waves and lots of current activity and so you know where it's coming from oh, yeah. <laughs> there's a, an endless supply <laughs> we, just need, we need swimmable waterways swimmable oceans drinkable water fresh water and it's just it's shocking it's 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 part of our ecological health but I, ecological health but i think it's part of our mental health as well I, I, how sad would it be we cannot share the screen because this new laptop has a password protection on it, which is flummoxing me. <laughs> what? Oh, it's what? true. Oh, so no. Rich has the slides available, and he could share his screen. I, I'd be happy to try and do that. Wow. You're a star. Let me, star. Let, me, let, me, <laughs> let me see if we can. We have a new laptop, and so it's experiencing some I didn't realize extraordinary that was... challenges. Yeah. An issue. But it is an issue at times. But um, I thought this is such a, you know, scaled I was up. not going to. Yeah, I know it's such a scaled up hotshot computer, but I was not going to interrupt the conversation to to, uh, to say we're we're cooked. <laughs> well, now we're now we're really going to have to roll through. Uh, we will. We'll we'll bam, 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 bam. Faster yeah. than speeding Sunstar. Oh, oh, I hope it's a little faster than that. <laughs> Well, how about some of the sea earth that literally danced across the ocean? Floor? Yeah, what about it? What about a, a racing? Uh, with, which which is a fast one? Is crinoid pretty fast? fast? Actually, some of the brittle stars are pretty fast. Brittle star, they are. It kind of threw you. Sea urchins are pretty fast. Swimming sea yeah. cucumber. Let's swimming sea cucumber. That's a good one. Let's see what happens if we try this. You can see it. Share your. Ba bam! <laughs> Amazing. You see it? Are we yeah. there? Let's go to the go to the uh, start from the start. Um, I am at the start. Now just go to IE. Go to slideshow. Okay, how's that? Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. Part See, two. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How are we doing? Is that Swift that all? Eating crinoid. Right. The yeah, I can't. I can't see anybody else now, but um, oh no! We all can right. see you. We can see you. Okay. And we see oh, the beautiful gosh. sea stars here. And yeah. Can... So this is this is the group that I that I work on: starfish, brittle stars, sea cucumbers, sea lilies. Um, is that what you're seeing? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So we're on the right track. And we're on the right, on the same page, literally. Um, yes. Is there another category of ancient econoderms? That, oh, that there are many. There are many. Um, there are about four times as many um, ex, uh, extinct classes as there are living ones, I think, somewhere in my neighborhood. So. Um, and they all have radial symmetry, yes? They all have pentaradial symmetry. Um, which is something that we spoke about the last time very briefly. Yeah. Um, but um, that is only one of several different characteristics that, that they have in common. They also have a water vascular system, which uh, feeds the tube feet with water, makes sure that they're charged with water and, and allows the tube feet, which are these sucker tipped, usually sucker tipped, not always, um, extensile, extensile tubes that the organisms can use to manipulate particles and to interact with their environment, their sensory organs. Um, they're very interesting um, bits of uh, anatomy. Um, but I don't wanna to get too far into that. I think what I would really like to talk about is just to very quickly summarize what we went over last week or uh, last time uh, we talked. Um, some, yeah, it feels only like last week. Um, yes. <clears throat> so we, we the urchins that are the things that I focus on uh, in my own research include uh, regular sea urchins like slate pencil urchins, the heart urchins, and especially the sand dollars, uh, some of which you can see in that um, bottom yeah. photo. 
Uh, regular sea urchins, we mentioned this before. Um, it, uh, regularity um, has everything to do with the anus. And in this case, um, we're talking about the position of the anal opening, which in regular sea urchins is on the top of the body, but in irregular sea urchins is at the posterior end. And this is one of the keys to the huge diversity that we have and, and can see uh, throughout the sea urchins uh, um, and is characteristic, uh, a, a character, characteristic imposition of bilateral, secondary bilateral symmetry on mm. a whole group of uh, sea urchins that just blew the the environmental possibilities wide open for this group. So we still have, have regular urchins today, but, but we evolved this bilateral symmetry, which allowed them to move on to shifting substrates and to do all kinds of interesting things, burrowing, and to um, do some pretty amazing things in the deep sea as well. Yeah. Uh, they are also most Sea urchins have this incredible jaw apparatus, which is made up of something like 30 different ossicles, which come together to make the uh, uh, teeth come together. They have five teeth. So that's another reflection of this five part uh, radial symmetry. Uh, and these teeth uh, can be used for rasping or for crushing, depending on the group that you encounter this, this remarkable structure in. Um, the engineering of this is is truly, truly staggering. If you um, oh, take a few moments, to take note. <laughs> yeah, talk about designing things after nature. These that just it's, it's really an incredible structure. Uh, it's not only something that the sea urchin can protrude out through the mouth, but it can open and close the jaws while it's doing that. And all of these different motions are possible all at the same time. It can be positioned, it can be rotated, it can be turned to bite at things. And um, the things that you can see, there's a little thing on the top there named a compass called a compass and a rotula. And the compass actually works in part with the rotula, but um, with a set of muscles that can also cause the membrane that encloses this uh, whole structure to sort of flap slowly for uh, res res respiration, for gas exchange, to help the oh. muscles uh, get, uh, like maintain, maintain oxygen. Like yeah, so it's cool. a, a multifunctional thing, really a remarkable structure. Uh, you could spend hours and hours talking about that thing that you see in that picture all on its own particularly yeah. the evolutionary consequences. Um, just to talk a little bit about um, the diversity of the sea urchins. Uh, the last time we talked about urchin divers diversity in a variety of different modes, but uh, sea, ur the sea urchin shapes are very diverse. And if you look at the upper left animal there, you got these, the, this is a, a one of these running deep sea, soft bodied sea urchins that can okay. charge across the sea bottom. They do. Um, like, and they have these weird, yeah, they have these very strange flaps uh, or uh, sacs on the top enveloping the, the spines. And nobody's too sure what those do. That nice bright red thing in the upper center there is a, is a new species as it turns out of hard urchin. And not all hard urchins are red, but this one does uh, almost look like a Valentine's Day card. Yeah, um, where, is it, where does it live? Uh, it, it lives in the Philippines. It's a new species from the Philippines. And it, it is, is that genuinely that color. That, that is a, a really amazing, amazing animal. Darn it. Yeah. The one in the upper right is a, a, a funny thing that um, can be seen in in places like Hawaii in the intertidal zone. And if, it, if you think it looks a little bit like a limpet, that's not a mistake. Um, it's convergent a little bit on limpets in so far as it has spines that are really flattened over the top, very, very short, that shed the energy of uh, ocean waves as they, they hit the top of the animal. It looks like a pangolin. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little. It looks a little bit like a pangolin, but I think it's it, it, it looks that way for reasons that are different from from pangolins. I think pangolins yeah. are trying to protect themselves from predation. This does yeah. that, but it's really an energy shedder. It's really a way for them to survive in uh, very high energy, wavy environments. Uh, yeah, clinging to the rock 
and the waves go over them without doing any harm. Uh, down at the, in the middle row there from, uh, from left to right, you see a, a, almost a spider-like animal, but that's a yep. sea urchin that um, walks on the tips of those arched spines, holding the body up above the, um, the seabed. Yeah, if you think of your little daddy long legs and things like that. I was just thinking, it, I just tick, 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 tick. Yeah. They look <laughs> a little bit like that. They're, they're um, I'm not quite sure why they want to carry their bodies above the sea bottom, but I think there's a, a weight distribution that helps them walk over the ooze. Um, and they can move um, fairly well um, and lower that body to pick up, use, it, use the Aristotle's lantern to pick up bits of food from the sea bottom. That center thing is one of the most bizarre looking sand dollars of them all, very flat animal, yeah. um, almost looks like a, a, a mask if you hold it that way. And those holes are used to help the animal maintain position on the sea bottom. Yeah. Um, through uh, the distribution of pressure from the from the bottom to the top. Sand dollars are shaped a little bit like an airplane wing and a surefire way to reduce the lift that might dislodge that animal um, is to um, punch itself full of holes. And I have another slide that if we get to it today um, that explains Not that <laughs> in a little more detail. Um, we can wonk out on, on sand dollars as, as airplane wings. Yes. Um, the one on the right is a, a, the bright red one there is a shallow water form that uses those spines to kind of jack them out and, and to hold themselves into crevices. Um, That's the, low, yeah. the, low, the lower left animal is a, a deep sea thing that, that um, people who sent me these photos originally said, what is this? Can you identify this? And, and, <laughs> and it, I said, well, maybe, <laughs> but it, it turns out to be, um, a species of deep sea sea urchin that has these curious upturned spines around the rim. Um, at first they thought it was some sort of a jellyfish of some kind, but um, uh, when you take a good close up look, you can see that there are actually two feet sticking out. In fact, you can see some that are sort of streaming off to the right there. Yeah. Very elongate, very soft looking structures. Those are the two feet of this animal. So that's a that's a clue that it's at least an echinoderm, um, yeah. and, and uh, we we know it's a, it's a sea urchin from the position. Really beautiful. It's a very incredible thing. And then the middle is a it almost looks like a walking peaked cap um, is a, a irregular sea urchin. So I talked about the deep sea one in the upper left there that runs across the sea bottom. This one in this in the center bottom is actually a deep sea irregular sea urchin that runs across the bottom, um, picking up sand grains. And you can see a sort of a trail off to the right. And what these yeah. things are doing in the environment in the deep sea is, is almost completely unknown. And then the lower right is one of the strangest of all of the sea urchins, uh, a sea urchin that almost looks like a little bit like a bottle or a, um, there are some that are even more elongate that, that look like Coke bottles. They have a kind of pinch in the center and these things cruise around in the deep sea, very, very great depths, over 5,000 meters plowing through the sediment and they don't look much like a sea urchin at all. They still look uh, like a tiny spines on it though. You can <laughs> see that they're, they're, this one, the spines have fallen off, They they but you can see the little bases of the spines for the yeah, spines saying, to the yeah. body. Yeah. Um, but that's actually the anal opening on the right hand side there. So this is a very, very irregular um, <laughs> it's almost almost convergent on on sea cucumbers or for that matter earthworms plowing through the sediment yeah. and swallowing mud at one end and letting it out the other. Processing. <laughs> Processing and doing things that we are still only starting to come to grips with in terms of yeah. what what the bioturb what they call a bioturbation when they scoop up sand and they disturb the upper layers um, and then process it as you say um, and create something else that comes out the other end maybe providing resources of a different kind for other types yeah, of no, it's, it's true i mean we don't really we kind of really take that for granted whether it's you know parrotfish eating the coral that produce sand or these right. or the deep sea echinoderms that are kind of processing those sediments maybe releasing some of the nutrients and or or adding some nutrients to it in the process yes. 
Biogeochemistry in action. Yes, nope. biogeochemistry in action. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Uh, now, can I? I um... Yeah. Yay. Yay. OK, so the last time we talked about weird urchins of Antarctica, I wanted to talk, uh, talk very briefly about slow motion chases in the Bahamas, where we have a, a, an interesting um, ecosystem in which there are these very large um, pencil urchins of a very long spines, and they are living at depths of over three, four hundred meters. And they walk around among these sea lily gardens. Now, sea lilies are also echinoderms, um, and they make their living by propping themselves up sort of on an L shaped stalk uh, with these little um, fingers that help hold on to the sea bottom, and they filter um, seawater that, that flows by that beautiful filtration device, that crown on the, on the top of the stock there. It's, but don't these they get, a, come, don't hmm? they get a royalty from Dr. Seuss? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they look a little bit like truffulas, don't they? Yeah, they <laughs> certainly do. <laughs> and, um, and they... They don't really make a living like truck. They're not photosynthetic, although nobody demonstrated. Uh, Dr. Zeus didn't go into that. But um, yeah. one has to assume if it was a plant, it was probably photosynthesizing. But these are, are filter feeding animals, filter feeding echinoderms that have, have these various adaptations to um, picking particles out of the, the uh, currents that flow by, the ocean currents that flow by. But the sea urchins live among these. It, they live among us and they walk along, along the sea bottom and they touch the, the, um, the sea lilies. Uh, and the sea lily goes, oh, holy crap, uh, there's a sea urchin and it's going to use its great big Aristotle's lantern to chew me up. So it falls to the sea bottom, basically, like a, like a tree, like a fallen truffula tree and starts crawling away. But before it does that, <laughs> no way. <laughs> it, it actually can use the arms to crawl. Wow. Well, before it starts um, this slow motion chase, it actually will release and break off a, uh, the distal end of the stalk, the, the tip of the stalk that the sea urchin is most close to. And it releases that kind of like the way that the lizards do when, when they break like their tail. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, they break the, the tail. They do out. the same thing. And they, they autotomize. They break that on purpose. And they leave that little piece of stock behind so that the sea urchin is preoccupied by that. And the sea urchin, actually, we've, we've collected these sea urchins. We've studied them. We find out that they, they have these pieces of sea lily in the guts. And they're eating them almost like little candy cigarettes uh, and, and chewing them up um, and getting nutrient from that and produ uh, producing more of itself um, in the form of calcium carbonate that it also gets from the sea lily. Uh, so there's this slow motion chase and the sea lily lives to tell the tale, uh, yeah. it sets itself back up again. And it's basically... Um, found a way to low in, in a low energy way of releasing something that the sea urchin needs without harming its own ability to reproduce because all of the reproductive structures are in the crown part right um so the this was something yeah this was something we discovered off the bahamas um, some years ago and it looks like a fairly simple ecosystem but for years people were studying why there were all these little bits of, of sea lilies in the sediment and the rate at which the sea lilies were releasing these pieces and they couldn't figure out why they were doing this um, but now we know yeah and it looks like that's been happening there's there's some several million year old very long spines just like the ones that you find on the sea urchins today and uh, found in the same geologic deposits, same fossil deposits as you find these um, sea lilies. So we know that this is something that's been going on for quite some time. It's amazing. They can be compatible, one fostering the other in a way, but without 
they're no, all doing no. fine. I do know though yeah. that the, that the sea urchins, when they can get a hold of the crown part, they will eat that too. Oh yeah, that's probably like <laughs> you know, the delicacy. Yeah. 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 I don't think there's anything benign going on on the part of the sea urchin here. I think they they would love to get the rest, but this the uh, sea lilies have found a way to to, uh, to get around that problem. Uh, Cut yeah. and run. Like cut and run. <laughs> cut your losses and run. Um, to touch really briefly on, because I've been to the Philippines so many times, I've just been staggered by the diversity there. I can I can swim for about four hours and see nearly 50 species of sea urchins. When you Incredible. consider that there are only about a thousand species of sea urchins living today and over 200 of those species can be found in the Philippines, we're talking about a fifth to a sixth of the biodiversity of all the sea urchins uh, can be, be found in in this one country. Um, and and that, we don't even know about the deep water. And we don't even, well, actually we know a little bit about the deep water, but not nearly as much as we need to. I've done some deep water trawling off of the Philippines and um, have studied collections made by others, but it's- um, As you say, 90% of life on the planet Remains Remains undiscovered. Undiscovered. <laughs> that's right it's 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 endless <laughs> and we need more people um to engage in the in this in this process of discovery so this is one way i try to express that through the interests of the california academy of sciences where i work um there aren't that many institutions that are dedicated to documenting biodiversity but this is one of them um we are also working with local um, in-country partners to develop conservation strategies, to do things like set up marine protected areas, um, yep. inspiring new generations of people in, in places like the Philippines to, to almost, almost the, working with them and learning from them helps us to understand how best to frame what we're finding in a sense that um, they fully comprehend what, what glorious representation of the world's coral reefs that they have themselves. And in right. turn, people like Al and we were talking about earlier before we went, went on, uh, on air, um, is, a, is a kind of hero who is taking data that he collects, data that we've uh, collected with him as well, and explaining and, and sharing the importance of um, coral reefs, but also the glorious nature of coral reefs. And um, so this kind of discovery and exploration, um, uh, for lack of a better word, it's, it's kind of sexy, I think, if you present it in a way that, um, that gets people's juices flowing and, and interested in thinking about um, uh, protecting these areas and capturing the public's imagination about um, discovery. Yeah. These are all things that come together synchronistically, synergistically, uh, I think, to help people understand why these places are important. And the sea urchins are, you know, just a tiny part of this, this story, but it's certainly true that it is a hotspot of sea urchin diversity. Um, so the Philippines themselves is about 7,000 islands. So there's lots of coastline in which to, to uh, build shallow water coral reefs. Um, it has a land mass about uh, an aggregate land mass of about the size of Arizona, but there are 100 million people living there, most of them in Manila, I would think. Um, and they are the most amazing people I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Um, the uh, the Philippines is is a uh, will always occupy a very warm spot in in my um, in my career. We hear that and so just, often from from you know scientists that have worked there that it's just a phenomenal space to to really engage with the you know the local community and they seem so committed to to really absolutely area and it's it's that as Sylvia says you know with the knowing comes caring yep. and they they really are embracing the. The beauty and diversity they've got, and, and doing things to help protect it, which is awesome. A remarkable place, and and this is these are some of the reasons why they're I feel um, dedicated to it, and and why I find it so remarkable. You got um, 
remarkable colored um, sea urchins like the one on the upper left. You've got ones that you have to be a little bit careful about handling like the one <laughs> in the center there because they, they do carry toxins. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a nice story about the one on the upper right. Those colored lines are called iridophores and they bounce back almost 100% of the light that's falling on them, uh, falling on them from the blue frequencies. Oh, and nice. they live at a depth that's that doesn't permit light to penetrate. So why would you bother doing that? They don't produce that light themselves. They cannot produce light. They don't biosynthesize. They, they, they're not uh, photosynthetic uh, or um, they're not, bio, uh, not bioluminescent. They're not making their own light. But it looks like they're, um, they've developed a startle uh, mechanism whereby fish that, that hunt like flashlights actually will flash lights at their prey. Um, and if they come across one of these urchins and flash their lights at it, they're confronted with this five part burst of blue light, um, which um, I'm sure isn't very inviting to um, a hungry fish. Yeah, it's just sort of bam. <laughs> yeah, sort of bam. Yeah, yeah, don't. And, and by the way, I'm covered with spines. <laughs> <laughs> so, our nature says do not touch, right? Right. Um, Nature's one of those signs. There's another one of those beautiful uh, sand dollars in the lower left. I won't say too much about the holes because um, uh, we might be able to cover that later. Um, I've said a few things about it earlier, but suffice it to say that this this species is very very different from the ones that you see in Florida. Not only in the num in the in the holes, but in the fact that it's adapted to those sandy bottoms in. Um, in parallel to uh, by developing those holes in parallel or convergently with the ones that live in Florida. So that's a kind of a window on the, the myriad ways that nature um, can arrive at a similar situation or a similar solution to a problem that these organisms um, are facing in their environments. Uh, the animal on the lower right, that bright red one I mentioned earlier, that's a close-up photo of those big hefty spines that it uses to jam okay. itself in a crevice. And you can see that one's really jammed into a crevice. I was oh, yeah. no going to be able to remove that specimen. Um, and then right in the center is something called a hair spine sea urchin. Now we, we have talked about the calcium carbonate skeleton that sea urchins, of which sea urchins are made of, uh, are made. And that's um, solid, it's like rock, it's limestone basically. Um, but these things make spines that are so thin that the limestone can actually be bent. It's almost like, you know, glass is like very hard substance until you spin it into something like, like fiberglass. This right. limestone also bend and these sea urchins have become so expert at manipulating the biogeochemistry of these organisms or, or of these substances that uh, they can make spines so thin that um, they are bendable. That's a, so cool. Yeah, I, I'd not seen that in a living sea urchin until I went to the Philippines, so. But this is a story that I really enjoy. And if, um, if I have a moment to, to just kind of talk very briefly about the connectivity of nature, because yes. this, these organisms epitomize how connected everything is. Uh, these are very tiny little sea urchins um, that I discovered living on a piece of wood that we had trawled up from about, about a thousand meters. Hmm. Um, People don't know this, but wood does find its way into the deep sea. Not everyone realizes that um, wood that's floating on the surface of the ocean doesn't always end up as driftwood. Um, it, cellulose, of which trees are made, is actually heavier than water and will sink. The reason that wood floats is that all of the cells that are surrounded by the cellulose covering that makes the cells of a plant um, become invaded by, um, are, are filled with air when in, a, in a dead tree, so the tree floats, but eventually the, the ocean claims it and 
the seawater will infiltrate all of those cellular openings, force the air out, and the log will become, well, I guess, waterlogged. waterlogged. <laughs> <laughs> and it will sink to the sea bottom. And these little sea urchins find that injection of energy into these otherwise energy, low-grade energy depopulate environments in the deep sea and make a living on the wood. That's so they, wild. They will, uh, they actually have uh, a kind of uh, gut microflora. We, we, and like, like us, sea urchins cannot digest cellulose. So they live um, commensally with these uh, gut microflora that digest the cellulose and break it down into sugars that the animal, that the sea urchin itself can, can feed on. So the story here is that the logs, it only um, finds itself on hardwood logs that grow in the higher forests that are left in the Philippines up on the mountainsides. And the, during storms, uh, these hardwood trees will fall into the rivers, wash down the rivers many miles, wander out into the ocean, become waterlogged, sink to the bottom, and become a food source for these sea urchins. And that, that level of connectivity has always struck me as being an interesting aspect of studying and understanding what, what the oceans really, how everything is dependent on everything else on this. On it's this a, and land to sea. Yes, cultural island. Yes. Yeah, yeah. and it's so, it's so interesting. It's like how it's the same often the same pathway that some endemic species on the land end up getting from island to, to island. They, you know, something comes off of the mainland, a big floating log or a big I chunk of so vegetation floats across and mm -hmm. over populates time, a different area. Populates a different area. Yeah. Um, and and um, I, I, the, most often um, it's, it's a steep continental shelf uh, mm -hmm. where you would find these, these species because you need to have more or less immediate sinking of, of the logs from, from the forest uh, to make this food source available to these organisms. And um, it's, it's a kind of a, kind of a miracle. We don't know at this point whether these, how, how the young of these sea urchins find themselves onto new logs or whether the adults find them. Um, we know absolutely nothing about how this e ecosystem in miniature actually works. Um, so that's a, uh, an important, I think, area of, of research to understand the, the interconnectivity of all of these ecosystems um, exemplified by a system like this. So, There's a wood boring mollusk that similarly requires wood for its habitat and food. Yeah. Uh, Ruth Harvard, using the Alvin years ago, uh, even put wood samples down into the deep sea, like 4,000 meters down. <laughs> and they became populated with these wood boring mollusks. Yeah, well, those wood boring mollusks probably displaced all the really cool sea urchins. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> share the news. <laughs> but I did want to touch really briefly on something that I call the value of sand dollars. Um, the uh, right, right now I'm working on a project with a, um, some colleagues in at the uh, Scripps Institution, working on the tree of life for all known sea urchin species. Um, that is not nearly all the known sea urchin species <laughs> down the right there. There's, as I say, about a thousand of them. So we do have to pick and choose. But eventually we'll, we'll get up to probably maybe about a third of all of the diversity will be in our tree of life. Um, and awesome. we can also mix in aspects of the fossil record because these organisms fossilize very well. And so we are getting a real time dimension to all of this, and we're discovering some, some pretty remarkable things. If you, this is a little poster I made up some years ago, um, which is intended to illustrate the diversity of all of, of, of the different sand dollar species. There are about 200 and some odd living 
sand dollar species. And they're all placed into this one big group. You've got the sea biscuits in the upper left. You've got funny looking, there's that funny looking um, monster mask, mask yeah. um, in the upper right group. And then the major group in the center is what, what I would call the true sand dollars, the sand dollars that, that I, I think are most familiar to people. And even among those, there's a lot of diversity. You've got two holers, you've got one holers, you've got five holers, six holers, um, all kinds of interesting, uh, different strange morphologies, even within what you think, you, not every sand dollar, you, you, you pick up a sand dollar and it's not one size fits all. They all have um, a variety of specializations that are a little bit surprising to people when you start explaining them. But what this molecular work is starting to show us is that this group here, is actually not at all related to the other sand dollars. So the sea biscuits and the sand dollars arrived on this morphology, this flattened morphology, living in beach environments and so on, independently from Incredible. the rest of the sand dollar group. So I was mistaken in placing them all together in the same group. Um, the molecular results suggest that all of these weird adaptations that they have to living in these uh, wave swept environments uh, evolved convergently. And um, that's a lot more interesting, I think, than, <laughs> than putting them all in the same group. <laughs> yeah. So, like, uh, like the Tasmanian tiger and wolves. Yes, it's and, exactly like that. Or bats and birds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you look at one set of adaptations they oh they all fly that's that's amazing and they eat insects and they do all kinds but they've convergently developed these amazing abilities um through natural selection that provided a solution that was very similar to the same set of um of environmental parameters very curious so I mentioned um, the, the flatness of sand dollars. There's that cross-section of a sand dollar. You can see that um, uh, it does look a little bit like an airplane wing and an airplane wing works at least in part through something called Bernoulli's principle in which fluid experiencing acceleration also experiences a drop in pressure. And so there's an area of relative low pressure on the top of a sand dollar in a current. And um, that causes a sand dollar to dislodge. And they're very picky about where they like to live. They need to have precisely the right kind of particle substrate sizes and food and so on. So they don't like to get lifted off and blown away to no. somewhere else. It's like they want to stay in place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, they, if they land upside down, can they upright themselves? But they can, they can do that, but it takes some time. And if the current's strong enough, it just keeps flipping them over. And flipping over. them, yeah. So they, there's, there's, three different ways you can counteract this. One is by fixing yourself in the sea bottom, like the guys in the upper left there, they actually stick their front end in and make their living upright. That's the one species that does that is the one that lives off of California. Go figure, the one that's weird. Yeah. So um, weird. The one that's weird. The second way is to add weight. And the juveniles will swallow magnetite sand grains, or maybe they grow them themselves through a microbiota and deposit those in a, a peripheral band of, um, of, of magnetite that helps add weight to the, to the animal's body until they become older when the calcium carbonate that they use to make their bodies, their skeletons, um, starts developing a thick peripheral set of buttresses and pillars. If you break open a sand dollar, you can see these. And those are used to add weight. So that also counteracts lift. But I think the most interesting way is to punch yourself with holes um, in such a way that you can e uh, equalize the pressure on the top. Yeah. It is very cool. And so they do that. Um, oh, oh, sea cucumbers. I thought I would <laughs> really <laughs> briefly run through a few slides here that talk about um, the different groups of echinoderms that are related to um, the sea urchins. Sea cucumbers are in fact not just decalcified sea urchins. They are um, actually giant larvae. Wow. If you study the, the growth sequence of um, any of these, uh, of something like a sea urchin, you can actually, there are 
truncate, you can cut off the end path of becoming what a sea urchin looks like, and you end up with something that retains a lot of the juvenile characteristics of the larvae that you see in other echinoderm groups. And that's what sea cucumbers basically are. Um, they have this tuft of feeding tentacles at one end. Uh, you can see in the one in the upper right there, that beautiful branching mass that uses, uh, that filter feeds um, and, a, and a little anal opening. Um, here's a quick look at the horrible mass of stuff that, that's inside of the sea cucumber. Um, it's not horrible, <laughs> it's, it's a complicated mess. Anything, yeah. anybody, anything that you cut open is going to look a little bit like this, I guess. But yeah, I, I wanted to say. point out the respiratory tree, which is, um, you know, people say uh, when they want to be funny that sea cucumbers breathe through their butt. And to a certain extent, that's true. They actually will pulse water in and out of the anus that goes um, up and there's a gas exchange happening between the seawater that flows up that respiratory tree um, and the internal body cavity of the sea cucumber. That is also the residence space of the pearl fish, which is this famous yeah. little thin fish that wiggles its back end up inside the anal opening of a sea cucumber. And it actually lives in the respiratory tree. It doesn't actually live in the gut. So yeah, home, home, is, home is where you Find it. <laughs> Hang your hat, yeah. <laughs> um, but sea cucumbers are, are clearly echinoderms. They have these beautiful calcium carbonate structures in the, in the body wall that are made of uh, a special uh, type of limestone that's characteristic of uh, all echinoderms. Uh, Cuvierian tubules is a um, mechanism that sea cucumbers use to uh, ward off predators, a set of sticky threads that they can emit through their anal opening. They can also kick out their guts, and while the fish is busy feeding on the guts, um, the animal crawls away, kind of like the sea lily story. Yeah, I was going to say, like sea lily. Um, starfish, some diversity of starfish there, including on the lower right, another species of organism, echinoderm, that um, lives on wood which we found in the Philippines. A uh, very interesting uh, thing that we call the wood stars. Um, but you can see the beautiful five-part radial symmetry in most of these. But in the upper right, the crown of thorn starfish has multiple arms that it adds later on in its uh, life history um, on top of the basic pattern of five. Brittle stars, very closely related to starfish. Um, you can see the resemblance, except that in brittle stars, the body, the central body is more strongly demarcated from the rest of the arms. And the arms are very flexible. They're almost vertebra-like and um, can be used to um, help the animal crawl really quickly across the sea bottom. Yeah, these are the high speed guys. You know, they're, <laughs> yeah, they're the high speed guys. They can actually really move and they can use, some species can use the tip of the arm to whip around prey organisms. And when you see that happening, you realize that these, these are not slow, <laughs> ponderous organisms. They can actually um, do some pretty amazing fast things. It is very like cool. Indiana Jones with his whip. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, except they kind of make a little cage around the swimming amphipod or whatever happens to be trapped. Trap it, yeah, trap it. Uh, sea lilies, we talked a little bit about that. There are basically two groups. There's the kind with stalks and the kind with, without stalks. Brilliantly colored reef organisms. The I love stars. seeing these guys. So pretty. Sort of, yeah, sort of a holdover from, um, from the Paleozoic in some respects. The stalked ones especially um, have this sort of Paleozoic look to them. Um, and one of the th things that I wanted to, to say about all of those things that I just showed you very quickly is, is that they all live, they all have representatives that can live in the greatest depths of the ocean. And there, there is a push now to exploit the mineral resources that exist there, pushed by our own love of the same technology that we're all watching this on. Um, you need these rare earths and unusual types of metals that we're, we're uh, mining to just about 
um, completion on land. And um, so we turn to the ocean as we so often do as a species uh, for substance, uh, substances that we need to help us in our lives. And one of the ways of dealing with that is to do deep sea mining. And I think clearly I can't do justice in the next few seconds um, to the whole concept, but I think that um, the organisms that I work on, the echinoderms, the diversity of the things that live in the deep sea, the new species, all of those things add up to, we don't know what's going on down there. And we need to know that before we do anything like this. Absolutely. It's, it, there's so much justification for caution, the precautionary principle here. And here's yeah. the thing. We have already mined so much from the land. And the great thing about those metals, those minerals, is they don't, you don't use them up. They can be reused and reused and reused. They can be reclaimed, yes. Reclaimed. Indefinitely. I mean, Bill Ford with Ford Motor Company said in a conference just last week, that they, we really need to focus on recycling batteries yes. and other, because we will never run out if we do that. Before we leave, you know that last slide that Richard has about being a, a biologist? Please. Oh, <laughs> I should, I should, I forgot oh, about you that. Gotta, I'm sorry, you gotta go back and share the screen. I know we're at the top of the hour. But, and I'm I'm so sorry to everybody who has questions. I'm going to answer the questions, but I've taken and, no, and he's coming separately. back. And he's coming back. We're, we're going to get. Wait, him you're going to make him come back three times? Yes, we are. <laughs> the third time. But this Twist my rubber question. arm. Twist my rubber arm. <laughs> the questions I get, you get, Liz gets. You know, please take a look. I mean, you concocted this, Rich, but it's it's the true. Truth. <laughs> <laughs> this is our reality. I do. Yeah, this is the reality right here. What society? <laughs> yeah, this is something I found on the internet. I don't even remember where, but, <laughs> but the lower right could not. What I really do is 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 that's only part of it. Obviously, <laughs> what yeah, I would I like to do is is the MacGyver stuff. That's that's a lot. Yeah, in our but I think all of our guests look like this. You know, it's just. <laughs> Actually, but, we all do a little bit of each of these things. Yeah, I think that's that's the case. It's, that's the truism it, in this slide. So. It really is fun. It is among fun. other things, but it's priceless. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now you can now you can stop sharing. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop sharing. All right, there we go. Awesome, thank you. But we are a little bit past the top of the hour. Yeah. Um, we, and we did a few questions, but I will. Um, I was bound and determined to get through the slides so that the next I know. time we meet, I know. We, we keep can talking. start afresh. Yes. All right. But but before we do close today, I really want to say thank you, Rich, and to Ocean Elders, our producers, and most of all of you out there in the community that keep coming back to dive in and participating with us. Especially to come back to listen to this guy. Yeah, right. <laughs> Water connects us all. And we're so grateful to you. Um, enjoy the summer. We're going to be taking a break until September. But until then, take care of the ocean. As if your life depends on it, because, because it does. It does. It does. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And I'll get your questions. Promise. <laughs> Bye for now. <laughs>